The final podcast is one on implantation failure. And I invite you to watch this very carefully because very often the failure of IVF to be successful is not something wrong with the embryo or the egg, but rather a problem with the receptivity of the uterine lining. I like to use the seed soil analogy where the seed is the embryo and the lining is the uterus. And there you cannot put a good seed in a bad soil or a bad seed in a good soil. Again, factors such as thickness of the endometrium, factors such as immunologic factors that affect implantation, and irregularities of the uterine cavity must be excluded when there's unexplained recurrent IVF failure. Welcome to the Egg Whisperer Show, a program exclusively designed to promote reproductive health awareness and discuss fertility preservation options. Here is your host, the Harvard-educated fertility specialist, Dr. Amy. She's known as the Egg Whisperer. Fertility expert, Dr. Amy Vazadin. And you have yet another success story just launched by an East Bay fertility doctor. Welcome to the Egg Whisperer Show. I am so honored to have Dr. Cher back on. Welcome, Jeff. It's a pleasure to be with you, Amy. Thank you. I've had so much amazing feedback from our last two interviews. So for those of you who didn't tune in and don't know who Dr. Cher is, you really should. Let me just tell you a little bit about him. He is co-founder of Cher Fertility Solutions and an internationally renowned expert in the field of assisted reproductive technology and influential in the births of more than 17,000 IVF babies. One day, I hope that I'll be able to say the same thing about myself. Over the last 30 years, he's helped fashion the entire field of ART after training Under the fathers of IVF, Dr. Patrick Steptoe and Robert Edwards, he established the first private IVF program in the United States in 1982, then later expanded his practice to include a number of centers throughout California before founding the first Share Fertility Solutions in Las Vegas. You're also the author of several books, In Vitro Fertilization, The ART of Making Babies, which is now in its third edition. Welcome back. Thank you. So we're going to talk about implantation failure during IVF. Like, why the heck do these embryos not stick and grow? First question, what is implantation? Can you explain it? When an embryo reaches the uterus, it engages in a crosstalk with the endometrial cells. Uh, There's a to and flow of the language of the embryo and the endometrium, which is known as the cytokine network. At that point, the endometrium then allows the embryo to sink its root system into the wall. And uh, the root system is what we call the trophoblast. Slowly uh, engages the uh, endometrial lining. And with every millimicron of expansion, it comes into more and more contact with the uterus's cells, including the immune cells. This crosstalk, this dialogue, gets into a real conversation and the embryo takes off and then implants and produces uh, a conceptus, which is the implanting embryo. So the trophectoderm is that layer of cells on the outside of the embryo that we typically even biopsy when we're doing genetic testing. Is that right? That is correct. And I've had patients that say things to me like, I really wish that my embryo would have even miscarried. And I think that sometimes people even think of an embryo not sticking and growing and miscarried as the same thing. So basically my question for you, is implantation failure the same thing as miscarriage? Well, it depends how you look at it. When an embryo reaches the uterus and it tries to implant its root system, obviously, as I've explained earlier, it is initiated by a crosstalk between the embryo and the cells of the endometrium. Now, if the embryo is defective or abnormal, it's unable to engage in a proper crosstalk, and many of those embryos are lost simply because there's no conversation going on. Those embryos are lost uh, either uh, before the woman knows she's pregnant, she thinks she's not getting pregnant, but she loses it so early, or it's lost a little bit later on. The embryo manages to get a few whispers in, and the embryo's root system starts to take, and then it is lost. It is shed. It is uh, unable to continue the dialogue. The embryo is lost. 
Now, an embryo can also be normal, completely normal, and reach the uterus, but not a be able to attach. You will recall that perhaps in one of the uh, presentations I did before to your group, we talk about a seed-soil relationship. The embryo is the seed, the uterine lining is the soil, and obviously it can be the seed that's defective, as I pointed out, or it can be the soil that's non-receptive. And of course, if the soil is non-receptive, then we have an implantation dysfunction linked to lack of receptivity of the uterus. And what are the most common reasons for that to happen? It's so frustrating. I mean, we work so hard for these embryos. How would you describe it to a patient of yours when they ask you, Dr. Scherer, why did my normal embryo not stick and grow? Well, I think the, that's a very good question. You couched it by adding the last one, my normal embryos. First, we have to assume that that diagnosis of the embryos being normal based upon its appearance under a microscope, its development under the microscope over time, or as a consequence of PGT or PGS testing, where we actually sample the embryo's chromosomal integrity and find that the embryo's got exactly the right number of chromosomes it should have, which is 46. If an embryo is more or less than that, such an embryo is aneuploid or incompetent. So to make the assumption that because an embryo looks normal and even tests normal by PGT that it is normal is not absolutely spot on. The truth is that an embryo can be abnormal for non-chromosomal reasons. It can look good, but still be abnormal because of the fact that there are genetic abnormalities on the genes are on the surface of the chromosome. So we can see that 65% of the time, if an embryo is not competent, it is going to be because of the chromosomal integrity, aneuploidy. But in about 45, 35 to 40 percent of the time. It's got nothing to do with that. It's got to do with genetic or metabolic factors that are affecting implantation. And as you know, Amy, there's very little we know about this area. It's a, it's a really brand new area where we really are in the dark. So when people say my embryos look good, they tested good, but I didn't get pregnant, and therefore there must be something else wrong, that's not perfectly correct. It could still be the embryo and we're missing it. And that's more likely if there are any predisposing factors in the person's history and can also be age related. Now, if the embryo doesn't attach because of something in receptivity of the uterus, that's really the subject of this conversation. So you assuming that the chances are overwhelming that the embryos you used are going to implant because they were normal, and let's keep that assumption, even though it's not strictly speaking absolutely correct. Let's assume, therefore, that the problem lies with the actual attachment of the embryo. Now, there you need to, uh, your, your listeners need to understand that uh, there are many causes. There are probably 50, 60 things we could talk about here today. But the truth of the matter is that 90% of the time when an embryo won't attach purely because of a uterine factor, it is one of three things that are happening. The first is that the thickness of the uterine lining is inadequate. Uh, the uterine lining is the part where the embryo sinks its roots into. And of course, if that uterine lining is too thin, it's like a seed trying to establish itself in a planter box where there's very little soil, it's like trying to grow a seed on bedrock. So under those circumstances, the embryo might initially attach, often it won't at all, but then it'll come away because there's nowhere for the roots to permeate, to fulfill the nutritional, respiratory, and endocrinologic function of the developing placenta. So it could be that the lining is too thin. I first described this in 1990, I wrote a paper on this, and um, it since has been really accepted all over the world. You have to have a lining that measures at least eight millimeters. In the beginning, I thought that there needed to be what we call a trilaminar lining, three line appearance of that lining under ultrasound. Now we know that's certainly less important because if the uterus is in certain positions, you won't be able to establish those three lines, even if they're there, that three layers, that trilaminar appearance. Thickness is important. Ideally, the embryo need the lining needs to be more than nine millimeters thick, 
on the day you trigger with the HCG or on the day you start progesterone shots with embryo recipient cycles. If it is such as egg donation, such as frozen embryo transfers and so forth. So clearly we need to have a lining that measures ideally over nine, but certainly over eight. Eight to nine is a kind of a gray zone. Be honest with you, Amy, if I have a lining in a patient of under eight millimeters, at that point, I won't even do the transfer. I'll recommend deferring it, trying to find the cause of the problem and solving it before coming back to do the transfer in a later cycle. Of course, it takes about seven or eight days of exposure to estrogen for that lining to thicken optimally, to proliferate to that level of thickness. And you can't measure it earlier than that. But if after seven or eight days of estrogen exposure, be it in the natural cycle, be it in a stimulated cycle, or be it in an embryo recipient cycle, it should at least reach eight millimeters. And so that's in terms of the thickness of the line. The second factor is the normalcy, the regularity of the uterine cavity. Let me establish a very simple concept. Every one of your listeners has heard of the contraceptive method known as use of an IUD. Few people realize that an IUD does not prevent pregnancy. You put it in the uterus to establish what we call a foreign body reaction. The uterus recognizes that here's a foreign body, and so it attempts to uh, evict that foreign body. And it does so by attracting immune cells largely known as macrophages to the uterus, which then will congregate around that foreign body. And so the IUD, in with an IUD, so with an IUD, a woman actually gets pregnant but loses the pregnancy over and over. Now you could have your own foreign body in the uterus if you have a little polyp, which is like a mushroom growing into the wall. If there are fibroid tumors in the wall that project into the uterine cavity, or if there are adhesions caused by previous scarring, which is either due to surgical uh, damage, but usually in the vast majority of cases, it's an inflammation that occurs after pregnancies occurred, be it after the birth of a baby, after an infected abortion, or after a miscarriage where products of conception are retained and become infected. So if that happens, you have a foreign body in the uterus and it will reject the embryo by the same mechanism as, as an IUD rejects a pregnancy. The third factor is one that I recognize. To many uninitiated, it is controversial. To me, it's as clear as night and day, and that is that there are immunologic factors, which we spoke about before, which I won't go into here again, but these occur in women who themselves or in their family history give a history of an autoimmune condition. And by the way, I lump another condition amongst those known as endometriosis, because I'm convinced and there's a lot of literature that suggests that endometriosis is also an immunologic disorder. But anyhow, to, to cut a long story short, if there are uh, if there are immunologic predisposing factors, either in personal history or in family history, which predisposes the woman, then these immune cells we spoke about before called natural killer cells become activated. Let's not get it wrong. We need natural killer cells. The species won't survive without them. But the way they function is by releasing growth factors, which are called cytokines that regulate the implantation. But if there's something wrong, as I've just referred to, then these natural killer cells become activated and they destroy the roots of the embryo. This is one we can easily fix, I repeat easily fix by regulating the natural killer cell activity through the use of a conglomeration of methodologies, including steroids, Lovenox, and uh, intralipid. We used to use IVIG. We don't use it anymore. I don't. And I was one of the first people to use it in IVF and have used it in thousands of cases. It works too expensive, too many side effects, and other things. But it's easy to fix this with intralipid and steroid, adding when you need it, also the Lovenox or the heparinoid to the equation. And then there is another variety of immunologic cause, which has got nothing to do with autoimmune disease. It's got to do with the fact that because the husband or the partners share a certain 
transplant gene known as DQ alpha and HLA gene, that this will result in the embryo sharing that same gene with the mother, with the uterus. It's not about the egg and the sperm. You can't fix it with an egg donor. You've got to be able to break that link so that it's no longer a question of the embryo matching the woman's body. And of course, the sperm fertilizing the egg will allow the DNA of the husband into the sperm, into the egg, and that embryo that results will also contain the DQ alpha of the husband. If that matches the woman's DQ alpha, then that embryo is too similar. And it's just very interesting that in nature, if an embryo is too similar to the host, it will be regarded as an invading organism, and that will trigger the same mechanism that I mentioned earlier, activation of natural killer cells that will then tend to evict the embryo. Now, those are the three that I consider to be the most important, and it's very incumbent and very important to identify which one, what you're dealing with. And if it's not one of those three, then you go looking in the whole big black box of other causes that can also play a role. So at what point do you work a patient up for, I don't like the word failure, I like to call it implantation issues. It sounds a lot milder, a word that I can definitely deal with. I wouldn't want anyone to label me as having something that's a failure. So let's say I've had one transfer, it was not successful. Would you do the workup at that point or would you wait until the next transfer doesn't work? So basically, I'm asking you, at what point would you start going through these three different workups for the, I mean, obviously, lining thickness, that's from the beginning and checking out the cavity. But at what point would you go to your third type of implantation failure and do the workup for that? Okay, so firstly, I agree with you. The term failure has negative connotations. So I use the term implantation dysfunction because I think it's the gentle way of making clear that there is a problem. But you can always address a problem if you have a diagnosis. Without a diagnosis, it's like going duck hunting and aiming your shotgun where you hear the ducks quacking. You're not likely to have a duck dinner that night. You've got to take aim, so you've got to know what you're actually shooting at. So at what point do I consider it a problem? I, I'm suspicious of any woman who has a predisposing factor. For example, in someone that has, uh, is otherwise perfectly healthy, we can find no other explanation, and the hus and she's young enough to assure us that most of her eggs are going to be normal, and as you know, it's the egg, not the sperm, that is primarily responsible for the integrity of the embryo. So clearly, if there's nothing to suggest an obvious cause for their problem, I become very suspicious, especially in the younger woman in her early to mid-30s, where two in three eggs should be normal anyway, and so two in three embryos should be chromosomally normal. So in that situation, I'll be much more aggressive earlier on. But it's primarily women that have had repeated IVF failures without explanation, especially if the embryos transferred bore, bore all the hard, all the hallmarks of normality, well developed, developed in a timely manner, developed into blastocyst, because embryos that don't make blastocyst are all abnormal anyway. No point putting them back earlier and thinking to yourself you would have done better because it won't help. And who are you kidding anyway? It's better to know why it's not working so you can fix it next time round. So clearly, in a woman that has had repeated unexplained IVF failures, especially if they're normal embryos, and even if they're not normal and the woman's younger, because I'm not one of those people, even though we were the ones that introduced PGS, PGT into the field back in the... 2005, I still don't believe everybody needs to be tested by PGT. Younger women who otherwise are perfectly healthy and normal, we know there's a tubal factor or a male factor, I would probably not routinely recommend doing PGT. It's for the women where there's no explanation and they keep on failing repeatedly. For women that have recurrent pregnancy loss, let me explain again, this could be loss as a chemical pregnancy before she even knows she's pregnant, or a loss when she gets into the first trimester. In that situation, especially again if the embryos that were put in the uterus were normal, or if the woman is young, I always go back to the concept that while by far the commonest cause of IVF failure, and 
recurrent pregnancy loss or miscarriage is the egg and the embryo, not the uterus. Only 20% of the time is it a uterine factor. That only applies when these losses were sporadic. It means a woman loses or doesn't get pregnant, but then she gets pregnant as a baby, and then she goes on and loses it again. If you put all the cases of losses, all the cases of unexplained failure, uh, failure in the United States into one big group, then 80% of them are due to the embryo going back to the egg usually, rather than the sperm. It can be the sperm, but usually the egg. But so the, the real issue is in those women where the, uh, they have had repeated losses and everything else appears to be normal, we start thinking about other things. However, if these recurrent losses were due to, were, re, was consecutive, repeated, like recurrent pregnancy loss, meaning repeated failures, now the cause is far less likely, in my opinion, to have anything to do with the embryo, especially in the younger woman. There the cause is probably, in my opinion, 80% or even greater due to an implantation problem in the uterus. And that's where you'll start focusing more heavily on the implantation issues I measured, mentioned. So again, recurrent pregnancy loss, unexplained repeated IVF failure, women with a personal or predisposing condition that makes you think they've got autoimmune disease, or a woman who's got a history of having had surgery to the uterus, like fibroids removed where they entered the uterine cavity and could have caused scarring, and especially women with unexplained infertility who have everything else going for them except an explanation as to why they weren't able to get pregnant. And I imagine that when you hear that term unexplained, you definitely break down what the possible explanations are for your patients, just like I do. I agree with you. Uh, infertility isn't ever unexplained. It's usually got an explanation. We may not yet be smart enough to know all the causes, but in the vast majority of cases, if you look into it, if you dig deep, you'll find an explanation and you'll be able to address it. So I don't like the term unexplained or idiopathic. I think infertility, you've got to look for a cause till you've run out of options. And if you find an option, you can address it all. You can say to the person, look, I can't fix this. I can't fix everything. And besides, even if I fix it, I can't guarantee you a baby because no human creates a baby. But at the same time, um, you need to delve deeply into it. What a brilliant interview today. Thank you, Jeff. I appreciate your insight on this extremely important topic because I feel like while we do so many IVF cycles in this country, the majority actually don't work. And I think a lot of the things that you explained to us today will resonate so much with all our listeners all around the world. I think that's true. I think that's true, Amy. It's one point I'd like to add to that. You made a very important point. Most people require more than one IVF attempt. If you look at the best statistics, and statistics are meaningless if you don't narrow them down to the subgroups and categories of demographics relating to the patients you treat. But if you look at the, the uh, IVF success rates, very few people are going to get pregnant with one attempt, unless you're doing things like egg donation or you're doing IVF with block tubes in a young woman. Uh, your chances of success are definitely under 50-50. So it's going to take more attempts. And most people going into IVF must be realistic about it. Realize that their chances are not a, a slam dunk simply because we do the right things. Because in the final analysis, we don't create life. I love that. At the end of the day, humans don't create life. And that is so true. We can certainly do our best. So where can patients find you if someone is interested in doing some of the testing that you explained to us, especially as the third type of implantation dysfunction? How can they get that workup done? Well, first of all, I'd like to recommend that people go to my website, which is shareivf.com. Now, it may be on your website too. And by the way, I'm very willing for you to put the book on your website. But there's a book on immunologic factors and recurrent pregnancy loss, the immunologic riddle, on my, on my website. It's a free download. You don't have to be a patient to get that book. So all you need to do is go there and uh, you can click on it and you'll download it free of charge. It's only 45 pages long. 
but unfortunately there's not a lot, a lot out there about a very important and complex issue. This will digest it and give you a chance to understand what's going on. So go there. Or if you need to talk with me, and by the way, I want to make this very, very clear. I have seen several people that have come to me from you and I've sent them right back because I think you are as good an answer as I can give. Maybe some areas I can little I can elucidate things, but I think that I'm not suggesting to solicit patients from you. But there are many patients out there that don't have access to doctors who really take the trouble to give the caring that they need to give. And I think you do. But if they want to talk with me and have a consultation, either on their own, if they come from you, they'll go back. Or if they come from you as a referral, as you know, then I'd be happy to speak to them. All they've got to do is call my lovely assistant. Her name is Paddy Converse. Paddy Converse, her number is 702-533-2691. And she'll set you up with an online consultation with me where we can go over your all your records and discuss your case with you and I'll give you a report which will be pretty long uh, but it will be a report that outlines what I think is going on and you can take it from there. Wonderful. You mentioned PGT just a little bit ago. I would love to have you come back on another time. Can we talk about that as our next topic in our fertility expert series with Dr. Cher? Be delighted. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you again. We'll see you soon.